Okay. Yes, it will. All right. Good morning, everyone. This is room 404. We're going to start the presentation is uh, hydrogen, the fuel of the future, and the presentation is going to be given by a uh, uh, Chuck Buckle with the uh, Johnson Company, and I'll just hand it over to him right now. Good morning. Thank you for coming. We presented this topic last year and it was pretty well received. Probably over the last year and a half or so, we got a ton of interest from clients asking us about it. And it seems like every day when I look in the gray news, there's something about hydrogen. So it's getting a lot of attention. And what we can talk about it. We've been doing hydrogen combustion for years and years. But only an application really that made economic sense. There wasn't another driver like CO2 reduction. So now, because of the risk of reducing CO2 emissions, and a huge interest in really not just hydrogen, but even ammonia and methanol and other hydrogen carriers. I'm only going to talk about hydrogen here. But again, we have lots of experience doing this, but not for CO2 reduction, which is the term. So, start off with a safety moment. Hydrogen Hydrogen today is predominantly made in hydrogen reformers. And this is a video that one of our field service guys got of a downfire reformer in really bad shape. In fact, I would argue dangerous condition. I'll play the video. This, so what we're looking at is we're looking at the side view of a row of downfire burners. There are tubes on this side, tubes on this side, four rows of burners. All of these burners are on. But when you see the video, you'll see that really only two of them are barely hanging on. Really dangerous. They were, we found out they were overfiring the heater by about 35%. And a couple of interesting things we found out is they have system plants that fire them correctly, not overfire them. They also have a set of burners downstream that they shut off. So they shut off burners that are supposed to be used for heating. And overfire these. So we try to explain them and said, no, we're fine. This is, you know, this way we prefer to operate. So we thought this was dangerous enough that we actually had our attorney send them a letter saying it's this. So the, the safety moment is that our folks are exposed to this too. You know, we're in this plan, we're one of our folks took this video. So pretty dangerous stuff. I teach as an adjunct and I'm always trying to tell my engineering students. Don't assume that everything is right to go to the plan. You know, when I got out of school, I kind of naively assumed when I went to a plan, everything was you know, done the way it was supposed to be. Now I don't do that anymore. In fact, we usually go to the plan looking for what uh, possibly is going on. I'll talk a little bit about hydrogen production. Why is hydrogen different than other fuels when you burn it? Advantages, disadvantages, some things to consider for design, quick example, and then some. So first, a little bit about the company. We are part of Coke Industries. Coke Industries is the largest privately held company in the United States. We're part of the division Coke Engineering Solutions, and we've been in business since 1929, so we've been around for quite a while. Here are some of the major divisions within Coke, and we are in the Engineering Solutions Division, and our division primarily makes products and services for refineries, chemical plants, power plants, things like that. Here's a drawing of the refinery. So we have quite a few products that are used in refineries. Burner side of that. We also make flares, which are not shown in this picture, but and for John Zane, some of our major products are across the top, some of the major industries we serve on the side. And I'm just going to talk about hydrogen for burners today. So why the interest in hydrogen? Well, hydrogen has no carbon in it. So when you burn it, it doesn't make CO2. As a combustion guy, one of the things that we're taught early on is when you have a hydrocarbon, you want the carbon to go to CO2 and you want the hydrogen to go to water, right? That's what we want to have happen. If you don't have any carbon, then you don't make any CO2. And of course, the interest today in global warming, we want to reduce CO2 emissions. So the heavier the hydrocarbon, the more relative weight of carbon to hydrogen. But with just hydrogen, of course, we don't make any CO2. So again, that's part of the interest. You also don't, as another benefit, you don't make a carbon monoxide because again, we don't have carbon. If you're burning most hydrocarbon fuels correctly, you shouldn't be worried about smoke, but you wouldn't make any smoke either if we didn't have any. 
So according to the International Energy Agency, hydrogen is increasingly important piece of net zero emissions by the 2050 level. And the U.S. Congress passed a bill, I think it was about three or four weeks ago, the infrastructure bill, where they want to establish at least four hydrogen hubs. The, our state is one of the ones that wants to be involved in this. We want to partner with Arkansas and Louisiana to make a hydrogen hub. There are other of these that are being proposed. And then they've developed, Mr. BC's developed what they're calling a hydrogen park in Japan. They're going to focus on using hydrogen in power plants and other processes like that. And just I slipped out a few of these, but again, pretty much every day I see something about hydrogen. So lots and lots of interest these days in hydrogen because of its potential to dramatically reduce or even eliminate CO2 depending upon how you make it. U.S. Department of Energy has a big project called H2 at scale, and we're looking at all kinds of aspects of it. Here, we're prim primarily looking at these two chemical areas and power generation, but they're looking at how you make it, how you distribute it, how you use it, things like that. So, it's a very big program. Now, how do you produce it? Well, this is an important question because if we want to reduce CO2 emissions, then we obviously don't want to make CO2 in the production of the hydrogen. So they talk about the color of hydrogen. Of course, hydrogen is clear, it doesn't have a color itself, but they term it based on how the hydrogen is made. If you make it with coal, it would call it brown. The most common way of making hydrocarbon hydrogen today is by steam methane reforming. So that would be the second one that, that would be termed gray hydrogen. If you capture the CO2, that would be blue. If you make it from electrolysis, these would be using electricity, then it has various colors. And the holy grail would be make it with some kind of renewable in the electrolysis process by splitting water. So, again, today about 95% of bulk hydrogen is made by steam method. The cheapest, it's the easiest, it's, it's very scalable. But the problem is that when you do that, you're generating CO2 because we have methane in the process. Again, the most common ways with reformers, there are a variety of styles of reformers. Probably the more common one is just a downfired reformer. So we have rows of burners, we have rows of tubes. These tubes have catalysts in them. They mix steam and methane with natural gas. Foster Wheeler makes a particular type of ferrous wall reformer. These burners are actually firing at an angle. They heat up the wall, and those walls radiate these tubes. And you may have an all radiant wall reformer, not as common, but the this as well. Here's a photograph of a downfire reformer in under construction. So we're looking up at the roof. So here are rows of the burn tiles, and not all the tubes have been put in back, hardly any of the tubes have been so far, but there will be rows of those burns. A little a drawing of what this looks like. So the reformer part of it, again, has rows of burners, rows of tubes, they fire down. These are called tunnels, so they help to make sure the flow is correct. Sometimes there are burners in the tunnels, and then those go downstream. And here's a row of these burners in downfire reformer. One of the things that's unique about these burners is that they usually have multiple fuels in them. They have a waste fuel, that's the waste product of making the hydrogen. So that waste fuel usually has a significant amount of hydrogen in it itself, usually about 25%. It has quite a bit of CO in it, and then it also has quite a bit of CO2 in it. So that's the waste fuel. It's at a pretty low pressure. It's usually in the middle of the burner, although it doesn't have to be. And then there's a makeup fuel, which is almost always natural gas. So the burner itself is a little different than a traditional fire heater. So that's what it looks like firing down. And these would be good looking flames. You can see barely the tube on this side. You see that on that side. Here's probably the most complicated configuration that you might have for a downfire reformer. This is the reformer itself. Then you have the exhaust gas going across the flow of vestibule. You might have burners in that vestibule firing. Then you go into another section where you might have superheat, 
And you often have an auxiliary boiler that's also putting hot gas in there. It's usually pulled by an induced red red fan that goes down the stack. So most of them don't have all of these sets of burners, but that's probably the most complicated version of them you might have. And just to give you an idea of the scale, I'll show a picture in a minute of the real one. It's a pretty big, massive. So here's an actual one. You can see the scale. This is a little minivan next to it. So these are pretty big devices. They affectionately call the top of the reformer the penthouse. If you've ever been in the penthouse, middle of August, in the place down south, it is anything but the penthouse. Wearing no mask, you got your hard hat, your gloves, your glasses, and you you just start sweating profusely. So it's definitely not anything close to a penthouse. But the key is that they are firing the fuel that has a fairly high, relatively high amount of hydrogen in it, which is a waste product. Now, why is hydrogen different than other fuels? Can't we just take hydrogen and plug it right into a refinery fuel? And the answer is maybe. You probably have to make some changes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. It may not be of interest to you particularly. But what I just want to show is that hydrogen is different than other fuels. So the heating value it has a very low heating value on a volumetric basis. We're firing it normally as a gas. It has a high heating value on a mass basis, but we're not, normally not firing it as a liquid. So this is important because you have to flow a lot of it to be equivalent to other fuels that you may be using now. That's an important consideration. We have something called the Wobe index, which is just a way to say how interchangeable are fuels. So for example, if you were using, let's say methane, how close is the hydrogen to methane? Not too bad, but the heavier the hydrocarbon now, the low is getting a little bit different. So again, what this means is you're probably gonna have to make some changes to the fuel injectors. Lamina product velocity. So one of the unique properties of hydrogen is it has a pretty high flame speed which means it's pretty susceptible to flashback, particularly in a premix situation. So that's something that, that gets our attention. The customer say they have a high hydrogen content in the fuel. You want to know that, and especially if they're going to have premix burners. Sonic velocities. So the velocity coming out of fuel injectors is often at sonic velocity. It's choked flow. You see the velocity for hydrogen is pretty high. And one of the consequences of that is it's probably going to make more noise if you don't change fuel injectors. So if you're trying to use the same ones, it's going to come out at a pretty high velocity and probably generate significant amount. Minimum ignition temperatures. This one is not too much different from some of the other ones. The heavier the hydrocarbon, the lower the ignition temperature. So it gets easier to ignite them the heavier they get. But hydrogen is not too much different than some other fuels so in terms of ignition. Not minimum ignition energy, really easy to ignite hydrogen. You do not need much of a spark. Static electricity would probably be enough to set it off. So if you have a final mixture, it does not take much electrical energy to ignite it. Adiabatic flame temperature. So the adiabatic flame temperature is the maximum possible temperature you could get if you ignited the mixture inside of a perfectly insulated vessel. Of course, that's not what we're doing in the heater. We are trying to release the heat at the whole point. But this is a relative way of comparing different fuels. And the higher the adiabatic flame temperature, the more of a pollutant called NOx that you're likely to make. So the NOx is exponentially dependent on temperature. So the higher the flame temperature, the more NOx you're likely to make. That's an important consideration for hydrogen. It does burn hotter than many other fuels. This is showing the adiabatic flame temperature as a function of the equivalence ratio. So the equivalence ratio is the way scientists talk about the mixture ratio of air and fuel. The mixture ratio or equivalence ratio of one means that it's perfectly stoichiometric. When you go to the right, you're fuel rich, so you have fuel rich, and when you go to the left, you're fuel lean. And what this is saying is that hydrogen has a higher flame temperature than both methane and propane over the whole range. Again, indicative of probably going to make more knocks unless you do something different. 
Another example, this one is showing two different things. This is showing a blend of hydrogen and methane. So all methane to the left, all hydrogen at the right. Then the air is being preheated. So the first one is not preheated, and then the next three are being preheated. So two things that you notice from this. One is that as the hydrogen in the blend goes up, not sorry, your flame temperature goes up. And also as you, your air preheat temperature goes up, your flame temperature goes up as well. Both of those are expected, and these will translate into predictions for numbers. Flammability limits. So this is the amount of fuel in an air fuel mixture by volume percent. So the low limit is 4%, the high limit is 74%. This is saying that hydrogen has a very wide flammable range, which means a little bit of hydrogen, a lot of hydrogen, anything in between is probably going to burn. Good thing for a combustion person, we don't have to be very precise about mixing. Not so good though if it leaks. If it's leaking from your pipeline, then finally the ignition source is almost certainly going to burn. And you may know that hydrogen is a very small molecule, so it leaks pretty easily. So we need to make sure that the system is tight so we don't have any leakage because again it's pretty likely to be tight. This one shows the amount of air you need for a stoichiometric mixture for each of these fuels. And what it's saying is that hydrogen needs less combustion air compared to other fuels on the same firing rate basis, in this case, per megawatt. So that's actually a good thing. Sometimes customers ask us, can we increase the capacity of our heater? Can we increase the capacity of burners? On the fuel side, that's usually pretty easy. We just drill bigger holes, right? The limit is often we can't get enough more air in there unless we make a significant change. This is saying that if you switch to hydrogen or at least higher hydrogen fuels, then you need less air so you could increase capacity without making any other changes. I'm not familiar with folks doing it for that reason alone, but it is a side benefit if you want to increase capacity. You can do that because, again, the air is usually the limit. This one is the predicted NOx, a really important pollutant, especially in places like the United States and Europe and many other countries these days. Again, equivalence ratio. So one is perfectly sleeping nitric. To the right, the fuel rich, to the left, the fuel lean. Three different fuels again, hydrogen, methane, and propane. Peak is actually on slightly fuel lean conditions. First of all, why in the shape of the curve like this? Well, one is the peak is slightly fuel lean because you have a little bit of extra oxygen. Nitrogen is not as reactive as hydrogen and carbon are. So it gets the oxygen last, so it needs oxygen, obviously, to make NOx. And the temperatures are also high here. So they're the highest theoretically at the equivalence ratio of one, but there's no extra oxygen there. So you need both high temperature and oxygen. Now, why does it tail off on both ends? Well, on the fuel rich side, we don't have enough oxygen to burn all the fuel. So, nothing magical, we're not burning all the fuel. So, we make less lower temperatures, less NOx. There's also a chemistry reason why we make less NOx there. Again, when you have carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen in the system, hydrogen gets its oxygen first, carbon gets it next, and nitrogen gets it next. On the fuel lean side, when you add in lots and lots of extra air, it cools down the flame, lowers the flame temperature, and you get less NOx. The problem is that where do we want to operate? Well, we want to operate about here, somewhere in this range. We don't want fuel rich, we don't want fuel clean. This reduces the efficiency. This side also reduces efficiency. It's dangerous. It's, it makes other pollutants like carbon monoxide. So the place that we want to be is the worst place to be for NOx. Again, hydrogen is the worst for much. So what do we do? Well, in general, we're going to operate part of the plane fuel lean, part of the plane fuel rich, so that the blend is where we want to be, but we try not to operate exactly at that ratio because that's the worst. NOx versus gas temperature. So this shows the exponential dependence on temperature. You think of this as kind of like the plane temperature. This demonstrates the Zeldovich mechanism for thermal NOx, very temperature dependent. And the problem is that as the temperature goes up, it's not linear, it keeps going up faster and faster. 
So anything that drives the temperature up is normally going to be bad for NOx again, unless we do something special to mitigate that effect. And sometimes we don't even show these numbers because they're scary high. These are equilibrium predictions. We fortunately don't see that high a level in the field, but we see the same trend. So these numbers are predictions, but change the scale, and you're going to see generally that section. Again, here's a blend of methane and hydrogen. So all methane at this end, all hydrogen at the other end. And these are the adiabatic equilibrium predictions. The more hydrogen you have, the more NOx you make. Again, unless you do something that's different. So these are perfectly mixed. Of course, in real combustors, we deliberately don't perfectly mix it. Now, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of hydrogen? Well, the biggest one that's driving most of the interest today is CO2. So less CO2, again, depending upon how you make it. If you make it in a steam methane reformer, you're still generating CO2. If you make it by electrolysis using some kind of renewable, then in theory, you don't make any CO2 in that case. But the main driver for a lot of folks these days is CO2. A lot of customers are asking us, what happens if we convert our existing equipment to burn high levels of hydrogen? A possible benefit is, if it's of interest, is more capacity, because normally the air is the limiting side for increasing the capacity. Now, what are some potential disadvantages? Well, we can talk about one of them, NOx. There are some ways we can mitigate this. Won't go into the details, but actually some of the unique properties of hydrogen help us do some things that we can't do as easily with other fuels. So one of the things, having such a wide flammable range allows us to do even more furnace gas entrainment, and it also allows us to run even richer and leaner than any other. And possibly higher noise. The good news about noise is we can control it. We, you can either change the injectors to minimize it, and or you can use mufflers, so we know how to handle that. I really think NOx is the one that most folks are. Safety, so it is more likely to leak. Again, it's a very small molecule, it leaks pretty easily. I used to work for Air Products and Chemicals, which is a major supplier of hydrogen. And we did some experiments many, many years ago where we were looking at burning pure oxygen and pure hydrogen. So it wasn't a rocket application, it was actually for a burner. And our safety folks said, we want you to have not only a flame scanner looking at the burner, but we want you to have a flame scanner looking at the flow controls. I'm like, why would, why would we need a flame scanner looking at the flow controls? Well, they were worried if we had a leak in our flow controls and it ignited, the problem is with a hydrogen flame is you might not see it because it's a pretty clear flame. In fact, in some plants, the operators, particularly on a bright sunny day, walk around with a small broom in front of them. That's I don't that's for flame detectors. You don't want to walk into a hydrogen flame. So they actually asked us to put a flame scanner to look at the flow controls in case we did have a leak. And increased risk of flashback. That high flame speed will flash back if you don't have enough velocity coming out of a previous product. Here's an example of a flashback. This one we did on purpose. This was in our test facility. And how we did it is we just kept increasing the amount of hydrogen in the fuel. We wanted the students to hear what it sounds like, so listen for the change in the sound. Doesn't always make that noise. Flashbacks can make lots of different noises. One of the worst ones I ever heard was it sounded like the heater blew up. It sounded like somebody shot a shotgun. They make different noises. When, you're, when, we, when we tell operators when you're walking by a heater that has premium burners, you should be listening to it because you can hear that. You can see it if you're looking in in many cases, but you can certainly hear it. So the risk with high hydrogen, if you have premium burners, is that they can flash back, especially turn that. Some design considerations, the fuel system, since there is a higher potential for leakage, you got to make sure that we have a, a tightly sealed system which might mean in some cases welding some connections together to make sure it doesn't leak, make sure you have the right seals. Again, we, we know how to do this, but you do need to make sure you do do it. Higher exit velocities. So if you're retrofitting existing equipment, you probably want to redrill the fuel injector so it doesn't come out too fast. That could give you some uh, noise problems 
and also give you some free time. Questionnaire. So if you need to increase capacity, then you can do that more easily without changing the burner, or you can just uh, use less air. Flame detection. Interestingly, with high hydrogen flames, there are some problems detecting them with flame rods. In our industry, the most common way we use flame rods is really on the pilots. We don't normally use flame rods to detect the main flame. So, but we do have an alternative method to do that, which is with an ultraviolet scanner. UV scanners, hydrogen flames make a great UV signal. It's easy to see. You don't have to be very precise at all with the scanner because it makes such a strong UV signal. Interestingly, though, it has a different flame frequency than typical hydrocarbon. So what does that mean? I'm old enough to remember when flame scanners couldn't tell the difference between a flame and a hot wall. That's not the case anymore for quite a while. They can distinguish between a hot wall and a flame because they're looking for the flame flicker. They're looking for the movement of the flame. And hydrogen has a different flame frequency, flicker frequency. So the newest scanners can detect that, but obviously it is important to know so this is one of our sister companies, Kentronics, makes, as far as I understand, the most advanced uh, flame detector in the industry, and it can uh, detect these as well. One of the things that I'm pretty excited about is these scanners know what a good flame looks like electronically. So if there's a problem, if something happens, they can tell electronically that something has happened, often before humans can, often before we can hear it or see it. So uh, there's a Term that folks are using called smart combustion. And this is part of that where you can detect some problems well before they become issues that they could be dangerous or they could damage some equipment. But again, hydrogen is different. It is different in terms of flame detection. And again, visually, you know, or you may know, when you look at a hydrogen flame, it's pretty clear. It's not as easy for us to see it with our eyes, but very easy for UV scanners to see that. Higher exit velocities, if you're using existing fuel injectors, more likely you're going to re-drill them to get bigger holes to make sure the velocity. Now, what about the heat transfer? With these clear flames, they don't, they're not luminous at all. There's no carbon in there, there's nothing to glow, so they don't have any luminosity to them, but they have a higher temperature. So what's radiating in a flame? Well, CO2 and water both radiate, but not very well, they're not good radiators. Soot is a much better radiator. We don't have any soot in the hydrogen plant, at least the pure hydrogen. I'm going to show you some results in a minute of that. Emissions, possibly higher NOx. Again, we have some ways that we can mitigate that. You can run leaner and richer to help reduce NOx. We can entrain more gases because we can run a much wider range of probability. And another minor thing, but since you're making more water in a most of Yes, analysis systems like a SEM system, you need to remove moisture, you need to remove water. The standards don't, or the analyzers don't like wet samples, so you may need to add a little more moisture removal capacity. Pretty easy thing to do, but it's just a thing. And just a brief example, numerical example this is a slice of an ethylene furnace. So two burners firing up on the wall, the burners are firing up on one side and two on the other side. And we ran three CFE cases just to compare the results. So the, the processing rate, the production rate is the same for all cases. Well, on this one, the temperatures are a little bit different, but I really want to focus on the heat transfer since that's a really important issue. So this is showing the absolute amount of radiation that we're getting as a function of the height of the furnace. So this is the heat transfer, this is the height of the furnace, and our customers often tell us that they want a particular profile for the heat flux. So for the case that has 100% hydrogen, it has more total heat flux than the other two cases. And the heat flux, slightly different place, not wildly different, but a little bit lower in the furnace. Again, hydrogen flames are typically very reactive. They tend to be a little bit shorter. So more heat flux, and it's at a slightly lower elevation compared to the other. So some conclusions. 
potential to reduce or eliminate CO, CO2, and soot, depending upon how you make the hydrogen. So if you make it the way we do today, you're still going to make CO2 emission. But if you make it with some kind of electrolysis process, then we can completely eliminate it. If we make it the way we do today and capture the CO2, then that will minimize it. The main driver for most of the entries that we're seeing Hydrogen is considerably different than other fuels. We saw a lot of different properties in it. We can retrofit it. Again, we have lots of experience doing that, but this is one of those things where you see the commercial and they say, don't try this at home. We say, we don't recommend you try this at home unless you have a lot of experience doing it, which and various design considerations. Again, velocity, if you want to increase the capacity, things like that, the heat flux may be a little we do recommend before you switch that you do an analysis to make sure you're doing it so you're not going to adversely impact it. Is hydrogen an important future fuel? I think it probably is. Will it be the only fuel? I don't think it's going to be the only one. I think clearly it's there's so much interest in it today that it seems like it is in the great world. Lots of countries besides the US are investing a lot of money in research and making conversions. 